Hi everybody, this is the video that accompanies chapter four of our textbook. And um, as usual, I'm not he here to read the textbook to you, but I want to uh, clarify and uh, elaborate on things as we need. And so let's go ahead and uh, go through this. So this is infancy. So uh, we're going to look at basically the first two years of life in this chapter, it looks like, the way that it's um, structured. Uh, and then obviously we'll get into other parts of development after this. And so, you know, there's stuff about overall physical growth. You can look at this. What I'll say is that these details are not important. Um, but just know that infancy obviously is a time of uh, a lot of growth physically. You can read a little bit about the body proportions. You know, uh, essentially they, a uh, number of people speculate that, you know, baby proportions are such uh, that it helps us um, kind of bond with the babies. You know, they, they look cute. Um, and there's some people that sort of talk about other species and other species as the, when they're young they also kind of look cute too. Um, so there's some speculation that some of this is to help bonding. And let's kind of unpack this uh, paragraph right here. Um, so uh, it talks about the sort of, it says transient exuberance. <clears throat> or temporary dramatic growth. This is um, this uh, synaptogenesis that I had mentioned before in class. And so there's lots of synaptogenesis, uh, especially in the first two years of life. So this is during infancy, what we're talking about right now. And, uh, you know, basically after this dramatic increase, I'd say this is kind of towards the end of uh, infancy, and we'll we'll talk more about this perhaps later. Uh, but basically, uh, these things kind of go hand in hand. So when there's uh, periods of great growth uh, in terms of our uh, neural connections, so uh, synaptogenesis, uh, oftentimes it uh, is either accompanied or followed by times of synaptic pruning. Uh, so remember we talked about synaptic pruning uh, before, and so uh, this is true here. So uh, we have synaptogenesis, but then we have uh, synapto, uh, synaptic pruning that follows that. And you know, it just basically talks about that here. So um, synaptic pruning is those pathways, those neural pathways, those synapses that you don't use, uh, they're gonna be eliminated in pruning. And so um, it's very important, obviously, for infants to have very stimulating environments, have various environments. Uh, this will help grow those synapses, so uh, reinforce that synaptic gen genesis uh, that's naturally there, uh, and then uh, prevent some of this pruning. Now, some pruning's uh, natural, so it's not like we we're going to prevent pruning altogether, but, uh, you know, again, having uh, Infants experience different things, different contexts, different environments will help stimulate those connections uh, that they're basically ripe to make. So their bodies are very much into generating those synapses. And so an environment that supports that obviously is going to be better for the infant versus ones that <clears throat> are limited and uh, may lead to this pruning that we're talking about here. So here it's talking about this activities um, primarily in the cortex. Uh, so the cortex is the wrinkly gray stuff um, towards on the outside of our brain essentially. It's the newer stuff. And so it, like it says here, it's kind of the higher order thinking and uh, control of activity, et cetera. So uh, the cortex is where we see a lot of this synaptogenesis and pruning, and that's uh, important because we're really talking about uh, the essential cores of us, um, our cognitive development, our emotional development, etc. And then talking about the prefrontal cortex, uh, this is pretty much true, so uh, the prefrontal cortex is still developing well into adolescence. 
So the prefrontal cortex is something that you'll see development um, take quite a while. And we'll talk more about this when we get to adolescence. And then, you know, kind of looking here, the prefrontal cortex has to do with uh, regulation of um, emotions, uh, control of impulses, uh, being able to plan, uh, strategize, have better judgments. And this um, obviously is not, uh, like it says here, it's not fully developed in infancy and shock toddlerhood. Uh, definitely continues throughout adolescence. Um, and I hope people keep that in mind. I sometimes think that some adults, some parents, uh, have too unrealistic expectations about their kids uh, and get very angry at their kids when their kids can't do these things, but their brains aren't ready to do these things that I'm highlighting right here. Um, so the prefrontal cortex is still developing uh, well throughout uh, adolescence, and so um, to expect the kid to be able to do these things, you know, especially if we're talking about infants and toddlers, is actually quite unrealistic. Uh, the, the brain structures aren't there. Um, so I hope you keep that in mind, uh, not only thinking about this class, but also thinking about how you can apply these things to real life. So we talked about synaptogenesis just now, and uh, we've covered myelin, so we covered myelin in terms of um, talking about the neuron in class. <clears throat> and so uh, myelin, as we, as we talked about, we'll, we'll just review it here, helps insulate the, the nerve cell, so it um, helps concentrate the impulses, the neural impulses. Um, so it's also uh, fatty tissue, and so fatty tissue uh, is usually pretty conductive of electricity, and so it helps uh, those impulses become faster. Um, so the, the big point here is this myelin that they're, they're talking about here, it's very much related to the synaptogenesis. Uh, it's going to help facilitate those connections between neurons. And also this is what we call um, white matter. Uh, so white matter is developing a lot during this time period in infancy and toddlerhood. So uh, white matter development is uh, quite intense and dramatic during this, this period of time. White matter is, again, uh, myelin and shows those potentialities for making the interconnections uh, between your neurons. <clears throat> so you can read, uh, read about this, about reflexes and voluntary movements. Uh, there's not a lot to be said. You can sort of look at this. And as, we, as you know, if you've ever been around infants, um, their motor skill development, so how they move, really kind of develop first gross motor skills, so general <coughs> movements of their body. That usually comes first, and then uh, fine motor skills uh, comes later. And so you can even think about it just as a baby, so uh, babies first learn to sort of generally move their hands, for example, or their arms, and then it's not later until they can uh, concentrate on their fingers, for example. So uh, a younger infant can kind of move its arms and start controlling that, but they can't do something like, let's say, pick up a pencil, because uh, that takes some fine motor movement. So uh, gross motor movement usually is the first thing to develop, and then fine motor movement later on. Uh, and these things are really important, too, because uh, there's really strong suggestions that these are not just about movement, but this helps develop your brain. And so, especially those fine motor skills, uh, helps develop aspects of your brain and helps develop those, um, some of those synapses uh, that we just mentioned earlier in terms of synaptogenesis. So, uh, it's really important to do that. Um, you can read about vision. I'm not going to get into this um, in detail, but just kind of notice that uh, this idea about use it or lose it is definitely here. And so, you know, in terms of, you know, we talked about this in terms of just your brain development, but in terms of your senses, being able to have different stimuli helps the kid develop their neural pathways. Um, so being able to see different visual environments helps them develop those visual pathways in their brain. And again, you can read uh, uh, this. Again, I'm not intending to read you the book. I just want to highlight some major things. You can look at the hearing and other senses. 
you're not going to be asked um, specifics about that. You can read about nutrition. Uh, what I'll say is uh, we won't talk a lot about this stuff. Um, not that it's not important, but uh, I find this stuff to be relatively factual rather than uh, thinking more deeply about things. So, um, you know, please read this stuff. Uh, but in terms of possible uh, questions on exams, uh, probably a little bit less important. So at each age, we're going to explore different aspects of development. And so one aspect of development we're going to explore at each age or each stage of development is cognitive development. And your textbook will have heavy stuff on Piaget. And so remember, uh, Piaget, we talked about that previously. So Piaget is a stage theory. So Piaget thought that uh, there's qualitative changes in thinking with kids as they get older. So for example, infants see the world and think about the world in a totally different way than, let's say, a nine-year-old. So there's qualitative differences. Also for Piaget, remember that his model is of a scientist, a little scientist. So for Piaget, the ultimate development is uh, hypodeductive thinking. So uh, being able to say, well, if this thing happens, then this thing will happen. Uh, and to do it in an abstract manner. And so as we go through Piaget's stages, you'll see that the development is geared towards those types of skills, ultimately. Um, so uh, just remember the little scientist model for Piaget. And one of the things you'll see in this models talking about the earlier stages of development is um, where these things have their roots, these, this hypodeductive thinking, and also um, errors in thinking. So younger ages, kids will have some errors in their hypodeductive thinking, and uh, Piaget will talk quite a bit about those errors um, as we go through uh, childhood. So uh, there's not a lot about errors here in infancy, uh, but we'll talk more about it when we get into childhood. And so for Piaget, the first stage is sensory motor. So essentially for Piaget here is that the child interacts and understands the world through their senses and through their motor actions. So sensory motor. Um, so uh, they understand the world through their senses. They're learning to uh, understand the world through their senses. And they're, and they're learning to manipulate the world through their motor actions, their movements. Um, so they become more systematic in their movements and more organized in their movements. And as your book says here, um, basically we see the infants uh, move from a state of reflexes. So the newborns have essentially just reflexes. And uh, what happens is that those reflexes become refined to more systematic and planned movements by the baby. So remember about the importance of movement. And then that leads to um, the beginnings of actual mental uh, thinking about things. Um, so while the, the early in infancy we have infants basically understanding the world through their senses and their actions, uh, these eventually towards the end of this stage, kind of towards the end of the sensory motor stage, uh, actually become cognitive things where the baby starts thinking and representing the world through their thoughts. Uh, so that's the movement that we'll see from reflexes to the very beginnings of um, cognitive mental representations of things. So, um, you know, it's probably good to see these stages and to understand them. So stage one, and this is within, these are sort of actually sub-stages of the sensory motor stage. So these, these actually should be sub-stages rather than stages. So. Uh, the first substage of sensory motor is reflexes. So the baby, so you can see here, it's really young, so the, during the first month. It's basically a bunch of reflexes. So reflexes are automatic. Uh, they're not planful. So the, the infant doesn't decide to do these things. They're, they're automatic, uh, without thought, 
uh, without planning it. Uh, they're just born with these reflexes. So if you've ever been around uh, babies, you can see these reflexes. Uh, they're not uh, controlled by the baby, they're just reactions uh, and they're automatic. Uh, but there are good signs that there's good neural development. So that's one of the things that they do. Uh, just as an aside, they check reflexes very early with babies because it will indicate uh, that the baby has developed well neurologically. So in terms of the sensory motor stage here, there's not much control of movement. They're just reflexes. Stage two, so you see here that we're basically going from uh, roughly the second month through the fourth month. And so here in this um, second substrate stage is, uh, it says here adapt adaptations to the environment, but basically what we have here is that uh, the infant, we see more voluntary movement, so it's not just about reflexes. And the really important thing here is that Infants will oftentimes do things by accident. Um, and this could be various things. So uh, it could be just simply um, moving their hand in a certain way. And somehow they find that pleasurable. Um, or, you know, uh, one thing to think about is that maybe the baby accidentally blows a bubble with their spit. Um, that's an accident. So according to Piaget, you know, babies, you know, they're not really very planful. They're just kind of starting to move voluntarily, and then they kind of just do something by accident, and they find it pleasurable. So I talked about this here. They said find it interesting. So they find it pleasurable. They do something by accident, because they're, you remember, they're brand new to moving. They do something by accident, and it's pleasurable. They'll repeat it. I'm not sure why your book doesn't have this, but this is what we call primary circular reactions. I know it sounds a little bit weird, but basically it's just saying that when the baby does something accidentally and they find it to be pleasurable, they, they'll, they'll repeat that thing. So if they blow a spit bubble uh, and they find it to be pleasurable, and they did it by accident, but they'll start doing it on purpose. Um, so these primary circular reactions, so why, what does that mean? So primary means um, that's the very first stage, and usually they're accidental. You know, it's just the baby doesn't plan these things, just does them. And they find it to be pleasurable, so they'll repeat it. So circular, that's what circular means. They'll repeat it. So primary circular reactions. And the important thing in terms of cognitive development here is that, you know, the baby's not thinking a lot, but the baby's starting to discover that they have some sort of agency. Um, so they do something, you know, but it's by accident, but hey, it's something that's kind of cool and I'll do it again. So this is the very first sort of stages of understanding that uh, the baby can control its environment and through its actions can manipulate the environment. Uh, so this is really important uh, development during infancy. Uh, let's go to this third substage. So during the third substage, which your book calls repetition, so this is uh, fourth through eight, eight months, the baby's becoming uh, more active. So it's not just about doing something on accident and then repeating it. The baby is learning uh, that it can do things. It can move in certain ways. It can manipulate objects. Um, so uh, you might see a baby at this age um, pushing things around its high chair. And so this is a little bit more planful. And so Piaget calls this secondary circular reactions. Secondary means that it's not an accident. The baby is starting to understand that it can manipulate the environment directly and be more active. It's circular reactions because the baby will try things. And if it's great, if it's nice, the baby likes it, the baby will repeat it. And so that's the difference between primary and secondary. Primary is um, accidents, but these accidents are something that the baby likes and they'll try to repeat it, like the spit bubbles. 
A secondary is, is different because the, the baby actually plans it, is trying different things, is sort of more planful in manipulating the environment. So, you know, playing with toys and moving things. Uh, and again, it's circular reactions because if it's something that's um, pleasurable uh, to the baby, the baby will re repeat it. And so uh, for Piaget, this is probably the beginnings of what we call schemas. Schemas are ways of thinking about the world. And so the primary circular reactions, they do happen by accident, but the, the baby's starting to develop some sort of schema, you know, about spit bubbles, let's say. The secondary circular reactions is there's um, more schemas in terms of this is what I can do with in, in the environment, you know, with my toys um, to do something that's interesting and pleasurable to me. So uh, we're really getting into the basis of um, thought here in uh, primary a little bit and then secondary even more so. And remember that Piaget uh, his model is being a little scientist. So with secondary circular reactions, you're starting to get a little bit of that stuff, a little bit of manipulation stuff. Of course, it's not hypo-deductive reasoning. It's not like, if I do this with my toy, this is what is going to happen. But there's a little bit of that, right? Like, if I push my toy over the table, will it fall? And if I do it with other toys, will, it, will those toys also fall? So we start getting some uh, thinking here. Uh, a little bit of scientific thinking, if you will. Very, very much the building blocks of that. So the fourth substage, eight through twelve months. You know, um, the infant becomes more social, and that's important cognitively, because the infants here are trying to anticipate what people are in the environment going to do. You know, so there's a little bit of thinking about other people and what other people are going to do, some, some predictions, so anticipation of things people will do. Uh, here it talks about the prefrontal cortex is developing a little bit more, so uh, the baby again is becoming more, uh, what it says here, goal-directed. And so in the previous stage, uh, we had babies sort of thinking a little bit and being a little bit more planful in their action. Now what they're doing is what we call coordinating. So they're starting to coordinate these things. They're starting to link their schemes together. So there's the thinking, the schemas that have been developing uh, in the secondary circular reaction substage, they're starting to link those things. And as it says in the book that they're starting to anticipate events. So we're getting into a little bit of that hypodeductive thinking, at least the basis of it again, because it's sort of like, oh, this is what's going on, this is what's going to happen now. So, oh, my uh, parents are in the kitchen, I see them go into the refrigerator, oh, they're making my food. So the babies are starting to think a little bit about these sequences of events, and this is um, very raw, cause and effect thinking. It's not really super cause and effect thinking, but you can start seeing the basis of cause and effect thinking here. In your book, it talks about object permanence. You can watch this video. I'll let the video sort of talk uh, about this specifically. Probably I would have put this a little bit later. Um, but anyway, one of the criticisms of Piaget is that uh, he he and his experiments uh, made it more difficult for babies to show what they could do cognitively. And so there's um, a number of people, including uh, Bayer Jean right here, who argued that uh, infants can do more than uh, PHA thought. And so uh, given that criticism, you can watch this video and you can see uh, what Barjan says about that, and that infants can do some things uh, earlier than Piaget imagined. So, stage substage five of the sensory motor stage, your book calls it active in experimentation. So, remember, uh, the scientist is uh, Piaget's model. So, this is the 12th through 18th month. And so, um, the baby is starting to 
experiment with the world. Piaget called this tertiary circular reactions. So I think a, a good tertiary a circular reaction is the baby pushing things off of its, uh, its uh, high chair. So if you've ever been around babies, you, you can actually see this. Um, so they'll be in the high chair and they'll push something off and then the parent will pick it up. What will the baby do again? Push it off again. So that's tertiary. It's a, it's a more complex motor movement. And really kind of interesting is it doesn't have to be this way, but that particular example is it incorporates somebody else, right? So not only is the baby push, you know, pretty complex motor movement to push the stuff off the high chair, but then you have a parent picking it up, putting it back on the high chair. Um, so there's there's a also incorporating this idea of, well, if I do this, what will happen? So this is where uh, the babies are more planful and doing a little bit more complex motor movements. And you start seeing again the, the ideas of cause and effect, uh, even more directly. Very directly, if I do this thing, what happens? So if I push my toy over the edge, what happens? It will fall because of gravity. And then at the end of the sensory motor stage, uh, infants are developing what we call mental representations. So remember you, earlier in infancy, it's sensory motor. So the babies have to actually be manipulating the thing. They have to be able to sense it. They have to touch it or see it or taste it. And they're, they're directly manipulating it with their hands or feet or whatever. But towards the end of sensory motor stage, we start having mental representations. So it's not just about concrete objects right there in the environment, but now the baby starts thinking about things. And uh, you know, Piaget calls this transition to symbolic thought. So your book gives some examples, but I think a really good example is language starts developing much during this time. So language is symbolic. So language, you're starting to learn what words mean, what do they symbolize. So the baby can uh, say water, for example, or waba. There doesn't have to be any water there, but that's symbolic. So if the baby goes waba, it's saying to the parent, for example, I want water. That's symbolic. You know, the baby's not grabbing the water and asking them, the parent to give the water. It's a symbolic action, those words. Um, so by the end of, sensory, of the sensory motor stage, the baby is starting to have this symbolic thought. Something that's in your head and doesn't have to exist in the present environment. Uh, that's a huge development and that will uh, lead into the next stage that we'll talk about in uh, following chapters related to the next stage of Piaget. So that's a summary of Piaget's sensory motor stage. And as we sort of talked about Piaget's last part of the sensory motor stage, language development is becoming really important. And what I'll say is um, I don't want to read the book to you because I think that's um, condescending, right, to have this book read to you. So go ahead and read this. So uh, you can also look at these theories of development. This is really um, a very short summary of those theories. So Chomsky talked about LAD, so language, language acquisition device. So for him, uh, you know, people, uh, infants have this in their brain. And this was his, his way of um, explaining why infants uh, and toddlers learn language really fast. There's something built into our brain that uh, lets us learn really fast when we're at a certain age in terms of language. There's also other uh, theorists that say, well, maybe it's not as uh, strict as Chomsky, Chomsky talked about. Chomsky was pretty strict that this is um, something that's preset and easy uh, and uh, kids learn things fast. 
Um, other people said, well, yeah, there are is sort of basically a support system, but it's maybe not as hardwired as Chomsky said. Uh, what I'll say is um, I don't think we have to get into the weeds of that debate. Um, but I think it's pretty clear that there are what we call sensitive periods. Um, so sensitive period is when uh, it's easier to learn or develop something. So certain stages or certain ages, it's easy easier or um, much more uh, sort of um, prolific that you develop stuff. So language is one of those things. So language is not a critical period. Critical th period says that if you don't develop it, then you're, you're not going to have it. So we know that people can learn language later on. Uh, but we also know that, you know, there's a sensitive period here. So kids really are developing these things. Um, Skinner, she, uh, she talks about Skinner. So Skinner basically is about reinforcement. So uh, for Skinner, kids learn language because they're reinforced. When they say something, a parent might say, oh, that's great, or oh, yes, I know what you mean, and there's some sort of reinforcement for it. I think um, not many people care that much about Skinner in relationship to language development. It's, um, it's kind of like the same thing he says about everything. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily explain why kids learn it really fast and also why they make mistakes. So uh, kids, learn, kids make various mistakes and actually if you think about Skinner's model that doesn't make a lot of sense. So with Skinner's model, if they're reinforced, they should not be making these mistakes. They should, if they said it right once, they should be reinforced and they should be able to not make these mistakes. Kids make a lot of mistakes with language and so the reinforcement model uh, probably doesn't explain language development very well. Uh, social pragmatics just basically says kids learn language because they have to understand their social context. So kids learn language through their interactions with other people, through social context, through relationships. And what I'll say is that, you know, we can use some of Chomsky's Thing. We can use some of social pragmatics. Um, they're not oppositional to each other. Uh, these all kind of make sense. You know, the the baby is um, connected and bonding with uh, their caregivers, and so there's going to be a heavy social pragmatic aspect to their language learning. Uh, but also, we we kind of know that kids' brains are wired to learn language. That that stuff is not uh, opposite. So I think we can piece. Uh, some of these theories together to kind of say what's going on. So psychosocial development. <laughs> so you can read this. What I'll say is, and I don't know if we'll have much time to talk about it in class for the sections that are live in person, but one of the things I want to tell you is don't believe this self-soothing uh, BS that you probably have heard about. So in our culture, there's been this sort of self-soothing movement. And part of it is um, a remnant of uh, behavioral the theory, so Skinner's type of stuff. So there's, there's been some behavioral theorists that say that you know if a baby cries and you pick it up, the baby's going to cry more because you've reinforced their crying. Um, and then there's also this, this idea that um, you have, and by the way, uh, I probably should address that now, uh, the research is very strong on this. Uh, when people, when parents pick up their babies appropriately, so the baby cries and it's you know, appropriate to pick up the baby, and typically it is appropriate when the baby's crying, the baby cries less uh, as the baby gets older. So this nonsense that you're reinforcing the crying by picking up the baby is not supported by research. Uh, in fact, it says the opposite. Research says the opposite. Uh, appropriately picking up the baby, attending to the baby's emotions and needs um, actually makes them more capable to um, control their emotions and deal with their emotions. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that there's this idea of self-soothing that somehow if you step in and, and pick the baby up, the baby will never learn to be able to deal with its own emotions. Well, 
Remember what we talked about with the uh, brain development. So uh, the prefrontal cortex is not really very well developed. Uh, and definitely in terms of this stuff, probably not until adolescence. So to expect this little baby to control its own emotions is ridiculous because the baby's brain is not developed enough to do so. And so um, the self-soothing movement is um, horrible. Um, it's unscientific. Um, it's full of uh, nonsense. And so I hope one thing that you take from this class is um, to not self-soothe babies. Uh, we actually have also, if you think about it, we have all of these evolutionary systems in us. And those evolutionary systems say the baby's crying, we should respond to the baby. Uh, you know, if you think about our evolutionary past, how many babies would have survived in our evolutionary past if um, the baby cries and the parents just ignore it? Uh, that baby's probably going to die or be eaten by something. So to me, it's uh, also, you know, pretty much deep down, when we hear a baby cry, we want to respond. There's a reason for that. Uh, our caregiving system is built to respond to babies so the babies won't die. Um, so it also seems to me um, counter to our uh, deeply rooted evolutionary systems uh, that are there to help us survive. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that in terms of self-soothing. Uh, do read uh, this part. Uh, for those people who are in uh, the live class, the in-person class, we will cover attachments more in class. Uh, for those people who are online, uh, there'll be supplemental uh, video lecture about attachment. So you can read uh, about this uh, temperament stuff, uh, but basically temperament is an idea that uh, the baby is born with these things. Um, so the idea is that the baby is born with this temperament, and you can read more about this, and I might supplement this with some other material uh, later on. But basically, um, you can see here that they talk about the original research by Chess and Thomas right here. And basically, um, they had three categories. So there was, um, you can kind of see here, you know, it's activity level, how regular the baby is, how sensitive they are, mood, uh, persistence, distractibility, etc. Uh, by the way, the sensitivity, sometimes they do it by um, making a loud noise behind the baby and then see if the baby cries, that's a sensitive baby, or if the baby kind of just looks, or if the baby's unresponsive. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, that's one way that they measure it. So there's essentially three categories. One is easy or flexible. So these are babies that have a, a pretty good activity level. Uh, they're very regular and predictable. So like in, even in terms of like sleep patterns, uh, they're not too sensitive. They're aware of things in their environment, but they're not overly sensitive. Uh, they're usually pretty calm, uh, easygoing, and they tend to be pretty um, persistent. <clears throat> There's a slow to warm up category. And basically here, the slow to warm up is um, the activity level might be kind of suppressed. And basically slow to warm up means that when you put the baby in a new environment, uh, they will probably be not be very active, not active. Uh, they might be really shy um, and anxious. They might be quite sensitive. Uh, they might have negative affect, so they might cry more. But slow to warm up, uh, basically when the baby gets used to the environment, um, they start becoming more active, they're more predictable, they become less sensitive, they get happier. So if you've been around kids that, um, when they first go to a new environment, they're very cautious and anxious. But then once uh, they're in the environment for a while, they start acting a little bit more like easy kids. That, those are slow to warm up. And then there's a difficult category. I've never really heard about this feisty thing, but uh, difficult is <clears throat> the activity level and the uh, predictability of that would be um, unstable. So active sometimes, probably overactive sometimes, and not active other times. Uh, relatively, depends on the, 
depends on the baby, but might be more sensitive. Uh, the mood would not be uh, a very good mood. There wouldn't be a lot of positive affect, so not very happy, and very distractible. The basic idea is that uh, these things are inborn. That's the idea. <clears throat> what I'll say is um, the research kind of suggests that temperament is is not really inborn. Uh, there's quite a bit of research that suggests that um, the environment has a lot to play in, in this in terms of uh, parents. Um, so probably, probably not a lot of supportive research that this is something that is inborn in kids that, that can't change. Like I said, I might supplement this with some more material later. Uh, psychosocial development, so we have Erickson's. So remember Erickson was <clears throat> extending Freud's theory. Freud's theory was psychosexual and kind of had to do more with that uh, libido, that energy where it's going. Uh, Erickson was more about the social environment and how the social environment helps meet the kids' needs. And also, Erickson had a, a, a theory that went throughout life. So here, in terms of infancy and toddlers, <clears throat> we have uh, trust and mistrust. So remember, the baby is uh, vulnerable. All of the baby's needs are met by the caregivers in the environment. So the baby starts learning whether the environment is trustworthy or not. So trustworthy, the the caregivers are there, they're responsive to my needs. I can rely on them. They're good people. Mistrust is the caregivers are unpredictable. Maybe they're uh, really emotional. <clears throat> Maybe they're negative towards the baby. So I, they, the baby starts learning that they cannot trust other people, that the world is kind of a scary, a dangerous place. So this trust mistrust is a, is a big thing. And we'll talk more about this in relationship to um, attachment. And then the, the second stage for Erickson is autonomy versus shame and doubt. And so here the, the baby's starting to have a sense of independence, right? So the so-called terrible twos, you know, that, that stage in toddlerhood where the baby's able, the toddler is able to do things now on its own. <clears throat> and so you have the parents running around or caregivers running around going, no, 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 no. So that's part of this. So the baby, the infant, I'm sorry, the toddler is starting to learn autonomy with this new movement and able to control their movements, they can explore the environment. So for Erickson, it's healthy for the babies to try things, to explore the environment. Of course, the parents uh, need to make sure it's safe, but you want your babies to explore and feel like they have a sense of autonomy, that they can do things. Shame and doubt is the opposite. So shame and doubt is uh, the parents are anxious about the kid exploring, <clears throat> and so the parents might react negatively uh, to this autonomous movement of the baby or of the toddler. And the baby starts becoming anxious and uh, either be can become doubtful, so is afraid to do things. So when the baby tries new things, the parents act negatively or anxiously. And then in that case, the baby starts doubting themselves. Oh, I shouldn't do this. So their sense of autonomy is low. There could also be shame, too. Like, oh, you did this. You're bad. You're a bad baby. You're a bad toddler. And so shame is that, that feeling like when they try something new, when they explore the environment, they did something wrong, and it's shameful. So for Erickson, obviously, the more healthy development is towards autonomy. 
uh, feeling a sense of independence. Yes, the parents are there to make sure you're safe, but you can do things, you can try things out. Versus being anxious or ashamed of what you do. And then here's a, it's a conclusion. Again, I might supplement this uh, video later, let's see. So there's a lecture here uh, by the author of the book, and you're welcome to watch that. And to me, it, it seems like uh, verbally, there's an explanation of some of the things that the chapter goes over, so that can be useful for you. So slideshow, please watch the slideshow. And then we have the next chapter. So uh, that's it for the book video for infancy. Uh, there will be some supplemental videos for those people that are online. Uh, for in class, we will explore some of these issues in class also. Um, so have a good week and take care.